Hello everyone, I am Dr. Rohan Khandelwal. Hi everyone, I am Dr. Ila Jain Khandelwal. And today we bring to you a surgery and pathology integrated session where we will be covering few topics where both surgery and pathology are very important, not only from the clinical point of view, but also from the exam point. You know that integrated medicine is the need of the hour, and those are the kind of questions which you'll be asked in the future exams. So this is just an endeavor to bring our dining table conversations to all of you. We've been doing these integrated sessions ever since our post-graduation days, where we used to discuss cases which we saw in the clinics during the night time, right? So we are this is just an effort to bring that discussion to you guys so that you can retain things for a longer period of time. Now, without wasting much time, let's start with the first question. We have a 36 year old lady who is a Hodgkin's lymphoma survivor. And as usual, I'll be highlighting the key words because I've told you that to solve these long stem questions, the idea is to identify these key words. So she's a Hodgkin's lymphoma survivor who received radiation to the neck at 18 years of age. She notices a midline swelling in her neck and on ultrasound, there is a unifocal two into two centimeter taller than wider lesion. Now, if you remember taller than wider lesions, both in thyroid and in breast, taller than wider lesions signify that it's most likely a malignant tumor, right? A malignant lesion. Wider than taller means benign. So it is noticed in the right lobe of the thyroid without any lymph node enlargement. Ultrasound guided FNAC reveals it to be a papillary carcinoma thyroid, right? Now you all know that FNAC is the investigation of choice for thyroid cancers, except for, pap except for follicular, where it cannot differentiate between follicular adenomas and carcinomas. So now they're asking you the surgical management of this patient. If you remember, I have already covered that differentiated thyroid cancers, you know, DTC, you have papillary, you have follicular. These are the two most common types of differentiated thyroid cancers. In differentiated thyroid cancers, if it's a one, in, one to four centimeter lesion and it is a unifocal lesion, no extra thyroidal extension, then we can do hemithyroidectomy. But there are certain exceptions, and that is what I want to highlight, that the latest edition of Sebastian and the American Association guidelines say that although hemithyroidectomy is acceptable alternative to total thyroidectomy, in low-risk differentiated thyroid cancers, which are unilateral between 1 to 4 centimeters without extra thyroid extension. But what are the ex exceptions? The exceptions are radiation-induced differentiated thyroid cancers, familial non-medullary thyroid cancers, multifocal bilateral differentiated thyroid cancers, and extra thyroidal extension. So you need to remember these exceptions for your exam. And this question was based on one of those exceptions, which is radiation induced problem. So that is why in this case, we will carry out a total thyroidectomy. Now, some of you might argue that why total thyroidectomy? Why not a central neck dissection as well. If you remember, I've already told you prophylactic central neck dissection, prophylactic CND is only done in T3 and T4 lesions. It is only done in T3 and T4 lesions. This is not a T3, T4 lesion, so you don't need a central neck dissection in this case. Now, once we've done a surgery, you all know that there are two ways to prepare the patient for a whole body iodine scan. One is the traditional way where we wait for four to six weeks. But the other method which is gaining a lot of popularity and another thing which you should know is the use of recombinant TSH. So by using recombinant TSH, we can boost up the TSH and the scan can be done earlier. If there is residual disease or metastasis, then we give radio iodine ablation. This has also been asked many times in the exam. It is iodine-131, which acts via beta rays and the half-life is eight days. Those patients where there is no residual disease or metastasis, we can use thyroglobin as the tumor marker. 
and this is another point which me and dr ella want to tell you that you know that there is a condition where there are anti thyroglobin antibodies and what is that condition hashimoto's thyroiditis so in patients where there are anti thyroglobin antibodies thyroglobin is not a reliable tumor marker so before we start using thyroglobin as a tumor marker we always do anti thyroid anti thyroglobin antibodies and then we start using this as a tumor marker so this was the management i told you certain updates regarding the management of differentiated thyroid cancers and now i hand it to dr ila who is going to talk about the pathology of thyroid cancers which is asked almost every year in each exam so the thyroidectomy uh, which was done by dr rohan it came to me and when i started grossing the tumor the tumor looked something like this when i opened the um, a uh, thyroid gland uh, normally in a thyroid gland we see a follicle filled with colloid here you are seeing these gray white areas which are there and uh, sometimes when we have a papillary cancer we can see these small papillary projections right that is how we identify that this can be a papillary tumor and there are no follicles which are filled with colloid right microscopically students there are very important points related to papillary carcinoma of thyroid and they are mostly asked in the exam the images have been asked in the aims exam a large number of times so when i see this slide the first thing why we call it as a papillary cancer is we see a finger like projection what is a papilla it is a finger like projection but remember students every finger like projection is not a papilla here i am seeing these finger like projections correctly but you can also notice that these finger like projections have these cores the core of this finger like projection is made up of fibroblast and blood vessel that is why this is called as a fibrovascular core so as a pathologist it is very important for me to identify that why this is a papilla because it has a fibrovascular core right so papillary cancer anywhere in the body whether it is kidney or whether it is lung or thyroid it will have a finger like projection with a fibrovascular core now the important thing to notice here is these cells which are there uh, can you notice these nuclei are these normal nuclei no you can see they are clear nuclei the chromatin is dispersed that is why these are optically clear nuclei which have a opened up chromatin they are totally clear and these nuclei have been given a special name orphan anni i nuclei a kind of uh, this kind of image with a clinical history has been asked in the aims exam a large number of times and is a future question always right so these are orphan anni i nuclei optically clear nuclei why are they called as orphan anni i because uh, i always say uh, a pathologist is very fond of observation and imagination right we are very dreamy people so when i see uh, these nuclei it looks like a cartoon character which was a little orphan anni in which the eye of the nuclei does not have any pupil right so it's totally clear and uh, you can compare the nuclei to this right two other important characteristic to diagnose a papillary cancer on histopathology are nuclear pseudo inclusions now this is not a true inclusion it's a pseudo inclusion why because it is formed by the invagination of membrane right another characteristic is because of this invagination of membrane the nucleus molds there is nuclear grooving and this nuclear grooving it looks like a coffee bean the nuclei starts looking like a coffee beans right so this is called as a coffee bean nuclei so nuclear pseudo inclusions and coffee bean nuclei they are also other characteristics here i'll tell you another flash card in pathology students which is commonly asked in the exam the uh, tumors in which we see nuclear grooves or coffee bean nuclei please remember this list for all your exams papillary cancer thyroid brenner's tumor granulosa cell tumor langerhans cell histiocytosis and chondroblastoma correct lastly the fifth and also very important characteristic of papillary cancer is the presence of these bodies which are called as samoma bodies right 4 5 years back this was a very favorite question of the examiner samoma bodies are not seen in or are seen in right so this is another flash card in pathology in which all conditions you see samoma bodies 
so they are seen in papillary thyroid cancer any papillary cancer like renal cell cancer also serous cystadenocarcinoma of ovary meningioma prolactinoma and mesothelioma right so this image can also be asked in the exam along with the clinical pathologic history these are the five important points of how i diagnose a papillary cancer of thyroid and histopathology now i would also like to talk about a variant of this uh, cancer which is the follicular variant why this variant is very important because you know i see cells arranged in follicles so i start thinking no this is not papillary cancer this is follicular cancer but to diagnose a papillary cancer the most important characteristic is the nuclear features like grooving pseudo inclusions and orphan ani right so in the follicular variant although i can see that the cells are arranged in follicles but the nuclear features are those of papillary cancer right that's why this is very very important to notice then um newer entity which has been added in the 10th edition of robins and sebastian also is called as non invasive follicular thyroid neoplasm with papillary like features right why is it called as non invasive because it does not have any capsular or vascular invasion right and why is it important for a pathologist to tell the surgeon about this entity because it's a very low grade neoplasm with minimal risk of recurrence and an excellent prognosis correct so these are the important features about papillary cancer over to dr rohan so on a lighter note as dr ila was saying that pathologists are quite dreamy people and they like to imagine a lot we had a common friend who in his uh, second year viva uh, of this gross specimen of thyroid instead of identifying it as thyroid he very confidently kept on saying it as a testicular specimen right and he was so confident that he even described it as a seminoma and the examiner also quietly kept on listening to it till the end it was only when he got his result and he later went on and spoke to the professor did he get to know why he flunked the exam and he was he even told the parts of testes like the epididymis and all <laughs> right so you should know the gross specimens and the mic uh, and the microscopic findings of thyroid cancers they've been asked quite frequently in the exam uh moving on to the next question a 31 year old male notices a swelling in the neck he is also having episodes of sweating and diarrhea so there's a swelling in the neck there's sweating and diarrhea ultrasound guided fnac reveals a myeloid rich material now just by reading this much you know which condition we are talking about right so the surgeon discusses the case with the patient and also tells him about red gene mutation this is the other hint regarding the condition the patient's wife is pregnant and they are expecting their first child in 3 months time i want you to review the following statements and you have to we will do it like a true and false kind of a question this was made more of a inict type of a question but we'll do it like a true and false question so that you can learn more things about it now by the keywords it is already clear that this patient is suffering from a medullary thyroid cancer because of amyloid rich material which is a characteristic feature and red proto oncogene which is also seen in men syndrome So pheochroma cytoma and hyperparathyroidism should be ruled out in this patient this is correct because you know that in men syndrome and specifically men 2 syndrome where you can get medullary thyroid cancers and you can get features of hyperparathyroidism as well patient should go under should undergo red proto oncogene assessment yes that is correct because it has been seen that those medullary thyroid cancers which have a red proto oncogene mutation are more aggressive and also because they this couple is expecting their child in 3 months time it also has a bearing on the child's further management and how do we monitor the child's problems and risk of future malignancy total thyroidectomy with central neck dissection should be done this is also true now you know that medullary thyroid cancers are aggressive and i have already told you that we should stay one step ahead of the tumor right so in all medullary thyroid cancers we are at least doing a 
total thyroidectomy and central neck dissection, which is level six neck dissection. But there are certain conditions where you will even do lateral neck dissection. That is level level one, two, three, four or two, three, four neck dissection will also be done. So what is that condition? That condition is if the basal serum calcitonin value is more than 200. So this is the false statement. If the calcitonin, you know, calcitonin is also a tumor marker for this cancer. If the calcitonin value is more than 200, then we should do a bilateral lateral neck dissection as well. Also, if there are palpable lymph nodes in the lateral chain, then also you should do a lateral neck dissection. Finally, if the patient is detected with an exon 91 mutation on retrotongo gene, the child should undergo prophylactic thyroidectomy within one year of age. This is also true. I'll just elaborate on this point as well. So, you know, men syndrome is multiple endocrine neoplasia syndrome. Men 1 syndrome is on because of the meningene on chromosome 11. And this is known as Vermeer syndrome. Don't confuse this with Werner syndrome, which is adult progeroid syndrome. Okay. Now in men one syndrome, typically you have three P's, pituitary, parathyroid and pancreatic endocrine tumors. The most common pituitary adenoma is a prolactinoma. The most common presentation overall of men one syndrome is hyperparathyroidism, which is more likely because of an adenoma than hyperplasia. And the most common functional pancreatic endocrine tumor in men one is gastrinoma, right? Overall, you know, the most common pancreatic endocrine tumor is insulinoma. But in men one, it is gastrinoma. Don't get confused between these yeah. two. These two points have been asked quite frequently in the exam. Men two syndrome is because of red proto oncogene mutation on chromosome 10. And you can have MTC only. That is exon 618 mutation. You will only get medullary thyroid cancers. Men 2A is Sippel syndrome, where medullary thyroid cancer is the most common. Parathyroid adenoma, pheochromocytoma, and megacolon or Hirschsprung's disease. This is exon 634 mutation. This is the most common mutation which is seen in red proto oncogene. Men 2B is also known as men 3 syndrome and you have five m's here medullary thyroid cancer marfanoid features mucosal neuromas megacolon and medullated corneal nerve fibers this is because of the mutation of exon 918 now the latest edition of bailey and the latest edition of sebastian both highlight this very important point that these exon mutations tell us what is how aggressive the disease is and how early can it develop in a child who has this mutation okay so 918 has the highest risk that is why if somebody has an exon 918 mutation then prophylactic thyroidectomy prophylactic total thyroidectomy should be done by one year of age so in the question the child who's about to be born, he would also need to be screened for RET. And if 918 mutation is there, then the child will need to undergo a prophylactic thyroidectomy by one year of age. Prophylactic thyroidectomy can be done up till five years of age. So that is the importance of knowing these exon mutations. So as I've already told you that the histopathology of thyroid cancers is extremely important. So Dr. Ella will now highlight the histopathology of medullary thyroid cancer and she will summarize in a table all the other thyroid cancers for you as well. So medullary cancer of thyroid on histopathology is very simple students. You just see two things. We see spindle shaped cells along with, as Dr. Rohan said, this pinkish material, which is amyloid. You can see this pinkish eosinophilic acellular material. It is completely acellular, right? So this is amyloid, right? So these are the two things which we see in medullary cancer and histopathology. Now, if I ask you a question that what kind of amyloid is this? This is a cal. Why? Because calcitonin is a tumor marker uh, for medullary cancer of thyroid and calcitonin is normally produced by the parafollicular cells. 
you all by now know that uh, medullary cancer is the only type of ca uh, cancer of thyroid which does not develop from follicular cells it develops from follicular parafollicular cells which secrete calcitonin correct so that's why it's a tumor marker for medullary cancer that's why it's also given as a keyword in the mcq exams and a latest question which has been given in robins is that if the tumor is calcitonin negative what will be the marker right so in those cases the tumor marker which we now use dr rohan is carcino embryonic antigen right, right. and so the latest edition of sebison also says that those medullary thyroid cancers which are cea positive that is a sign of de differentiation yeah. right and they are more aggressive, aggressive than the normal medullary thyroid cancers also because i mentioned that sweating and diarrhea can occur so these medullary thyroid cancers can also be associated with secretion of histamine and serotonin yeah. which can give rise to these features so they can also be a keyword in the mcq exams correct so this is about the histopathology now a uh, pathologist whenever uh, so as a pathologist whenever we see amyloid and we suspect amyloid on hne stain which is a special stain and the best stain for amyloid which we do we do congo red under uh, under polarizing lens right and what does it produce it produces the characteristic apple green birefringent in this image can you people appreciate this it it has a golden yellow sheen right golden yellow apple green right you know why is it called as apple green again the imagination of a pathologist this is called as apple green because have you all seen those uh, uh, golden apples which are available in himachal right so uh, the color of those apples matches this color that's why this is called as apple green by reference and another very basic concept is that why do we see apple green by reference on congo red under polarizing lens why because of the cross beta pleated sheet structure of amyloid it's not simple it's not a alpha helical structure it's a beta pleated sheet structure which produces this by reference right now uh, with this brief i'll give you uh, this gist of all the thyroid malignancies because they are frequently asked in the exams right you all know that the most common and the best prognosis is papillary whereas the least common and the worst prognosis is that of anaplastic cancer correct uh, a very important thing which is given in the history in a clinical pathology question is radiation exposure or hashimoto's thyroiditis whenever you have this history think about papillary whereas this question was asked in neat exam a few years back that which type of thyroid malignancy arises in iodine deficient people or hypothyroidism the answer in that case is follicular cancer correct now i would also like to tell you a very important point about genetics right for papillary cancer two genes are important one is the braf gene another is a red ptc right follicular uh, two genes are impacted kras which is a oncogene and pi3k medullary as dr rohan has already told you red on chromosome number 10 or it can be associated with mantu syndrome and anaplastic is very frequently associated with p53 right that's the genetics of thyroid malignancies this question was also asked in aims exam 3 years back that which type of thyroid malignancy metastasizes by um, lymphatic root and the answer to that question is papillary uh, hematogenous root is mostly for follicular cancer whereas medullary and anaplastic usually follow by either lymphatic or hematogenous root right uh when i talk about histopathology we already know about papillary cancer and uh, medullary cancer follicular the only thing which i would like to tell you here is that cells are arranged in follicles that's why it's called as a follicular cancer but as dr rohan told you that you cannot do fnac to diagnose follicular cancer why because you have to differentiate it from a benign entity which is called as a follicular adenoma so when do a pathologist says that this is a follicular carcinoma we extensively gross the uh take a lot of sections of the thyroid gland why because we have to look for capsular or vascular invasion right we see that whether tumor cells are uh, invading the capsule and the blood vessels if it is present we make a diagnosis of follicular carcinoma correct so this is about a brief gist of the various thyroid malignancies which you have to remember right 
So before we move on to the next question, few things which I want to uh, highlight that BRAF is the most common gene mutated in papillary. This question has also been asked. And as Dr. Ila was saying that in papillary lymphatic metastasis is more common than hematogenous. It is not purely lymphatic. Yeah. There can be hematogenous mets as well. Similarly, in follicular hematogenous mets are common, but there can be lymphatic mets as well. So don't get confused that there will be only be lymphatic or hematogenous. It's just that papillary has lymphatic more than hematogenous, follicular has hematogenous more than lymphatic. Okay. We move on to the next question, which is also a very important question for the exam. Uh, so the next question is a 38 year old business executive. It, uh, she presents to the OPD with a screen detected breast lump, right? Ultrasound guided trucid biopsy reviews it to be an invasive ductal cancer. IHC for ER, PR, and hertonia was subsequently ordered, and the slide is shown below, right? Patient is really concerned about her treatment. Which one of the following statement is not correct regarding her management? It's a simple question in a way that you know that this is ductal cancer. What you need to know is how to identify or interpret these uh, these IHC slides, right? So before I move on to the various options, I would tell you that how do we uh, diagnose these various uh, ERPR new markers, right? So uh, one funda which I would like to tell you here is that whenever we do immunohistochemistry, uh, if some cell is positive, it gives a brown color, right? So when in exam you see brown color on a slide and it is a IC slide, that means that is positive. And when the cells are not taking any color, it is negative, correct? That's a basic funda. Now, what can get stained in a cell? Either the nucleus or the cytoplasm or the membrane. These two, these two are the basic fundas which you have to remember. Now, in this image, if you're a layman, this is ER, this is PR, and this is HER2 new, right? I can see that there is no brown color in ER, PR, HER2 new, right? Even if you don't know anything else, you see that there is no brown color. That means all these three markers are negative, right? With this basic funda. All these three markers are negative. That means this is a triple negative breast cancer, right? Now I'll actually show you how to identify these markers. So in this image, this is estrogen receptor. This is progesterone. In the left side, I can see that the cells are not taking up any color, any brown color. So this is negative. On the right side, I can see these glands, which are uh, the nucleus is beautifully stained brown. That means this is ERPR positive. You all know that ER and PR are hormonal and steroid receptors. That's why they produce nuclear positivity. So what is stained here? The nucleus. Another image, which is beautifully showing these nuclei stained positively, right? Uh, so a, a pathology students very commonly does a scoring when the surgeon sends me a slide I have to inform the surgeon about the ALRID score right that's a scoring which we do for estrogen and progesterone receptors which is very important ALRID scoring in ALRID scoring we do we see two things one is proportion of cells which are affected and another is the intensity of cells whether it is mild, moderate, or severe, I mean strong, uh, strongly positive. And we see the proportion of cells which are positive. If they are less than 10%, it is 1. And if they are 34 to 67% of cells which are positive, it is 3, and so on. Right? Uh, then uh, when I tell about her to new students in this image, can you people see that these cells membrane is positive not the nucleus but the membrane her to new is a membranous receptor right that's why in them the membrane is classically positive so this is her to new positivity correct so in this image can you people see that there is no brown color the er pure her to new all of them are negative that means it's a triple negative breast cancer right now let us go to the options First option is BRCA1, a BRCA gene testing should ideally be done in this patient. Yes, it should be done. Dr. Rohan in some time will let you know about when you should do BRCA1 testing, BRCA testing, sorry. 
patient has an increased risk of visceral metastasis yes the triple negative uh, tumors or the basal like tumors they are uh, usually poorly differentiated and present with metastasis right so this statement is also true this particular tumor a type of tumor is aggressive yes this tumor is aggressive her to new directed therapy will have a role in this patient no this statement is wrong why because you cannot use trastuzumab for this patient her to new directed therapy because her to new is negative right uh one another thing which i would like to tell you is uh, for uh, erpr we do the alrit score so for her to new also we follow a scoring system that is uh, when it is 0 and 1 plus it is her to new negative when it is 2 plus it is equivocal in all those cases we get the fish test done and if we see amplification of fish then it is positive right and when it is 3 plus it is her to new positive that's the scoring which we use right then um, another potential question which is a recent update is students uh, please remember this this is a cap guideline for her to new what is it when a surgeon takes out a sample right uh, you know uh, as a, when we are interns the surgeon keeps on reminding us that please put the specimen in formalin but we as interns we forget it or whatever you should not do it specifically for her to new there is a guideline that as soon as the surgeon takes out the sample it should be put in formalin for fixation within an hour right so so the cold ischemic time is One hour, it should be put in this uh, formalin. Otherwise, there's a her to new uh, expression deteriorates, right? So that's a potential question for future exams. Now over to Dr. Rohan. He he is going to elaborate on the molecular classification of breast cancer, which is frequently asked in the exams. So as Dr. Ella mentioned, now that when I remove a breast cancer specimen, I have to write it on the form that what was the cold ischemia time. because there have been studies which have been done and seen that if you delay it more than 1 hour then the hertony expression goes down and that can potentially affect the patient's management as well okay so moving on to the molecular classification of breast cancer this is very important for the exam the molecular classification of breast cancer is based on gene expression profiling uh please remember it is no it is uh, not based on erpr her to new yeah. we all think that it is based on that but i actually it is based on gene expression profiling and that is what has been asked in the exam by doing this gene expression profiling we are measuring the erpr her to new now there are four basic types there is a new type also which i will tell you about but the four basic types luminal a is erpr positive her to new negative and it has a low ki67 ki67 you know is a proliferative index marker it tells you how quickly the tumor is multiplying so luminal a the questions which have been asked this is the most common type it has the best prognosis amongst all breast cancers right most common and best prognosis luminal b cancers can be of two types luminal b cancers can be like luminal a that is erpr positive her to new negative but the differentiator will be high proliferative index high ki67 and another type of luminal b can be triple positive where erpr and her to new positive tumors can be there her to new enriched is erpr negative her to new positive and for her to new positive tumors we use the her to new directed therapy that is trastuzumab or there is another new agent these days known as pergeta or pertuzumab which is used basal like is the classical triple negative that means er pr her to new all three are negative and any ki67 usually it is high and they are positive for cytokeratin 5 and 6 now the basal type of tumors are common with braca1 gene this is one question which you should know about they are the most aggressive type of tumor seen in young patients and it has a high incidence of visceral metastasis that means there will be high incidence of metastasis to the lungs to the brain that is why as a part of her workup for a triple negative patient we even get a 
MRI of the brain or a CT of the brain done to rule out these metastases. Now, basal cancers, although they are aggressive, but one unique thing is that they respond very well to chemotherapy initially. And that is what is known as the TNBC paradox, that they respond well to chemotherapy, but they tend to recur also, right? Now, the latest one which you should know for your exam is the Claudin low type. This is the new one. This is now being classified as Claudin low. And Claudin low is triple negative. All three are negative. But the cytokeratin 5 and 6 markers are also negative. So that's how you differentiate it from the basal tumors. So this is a very important table. Almost in all exams, questions are asked from the molecular classification. When do we test a patient for BRCA? If already there is a family member with a BRCA mutation, then you test the patient. If the patient has triple negative breast cancer, less than 60 years, then you test the patient. If the patient has bilateral breast cancer, test the patient. If the patient has breast and ovarian cancer, test the patient. Male breast cancer, you test the patient, right? And in those patients who have a very strong family history, of breast cancer. These are the six indications to test a patient for BRCA mutations. So this was regarding this question where we've highlighted important points in the pathological aspects of breast cancer, which are frequently asked in the exam. Dr. Ella will be telling you about the next. So the next question, it says that a 37 year old businessman presented to the surgery OPD with recurrent episodes of bloody diarrhea, abdominal pain and weight loss since the past three to four months, right? Patient visited a number of local practitioners but wasn't relieved of his symptoms. Right lower quadrant tenderness is elicited on palpation. DRE is normal. Surgeon refers the case to a gastroenterologist. Colonoscopic examination reveals mucosal erythema and geographical ulcers, right? Biopsy was taken and histopathology is shown below. Serological testing showed P and K positivity. Which of the following statements is not true for this disorder, right? So this is a classical long stem clinical pathologic question which is asked in the exam these days, right? And okay. as Dr. Rohan said that the important thing to, die, uh, to do in such question is mark the keywords, right? So, and first of all, what we have to do is come to a diagnosis. If you come to a diagnosis, then only you will be able to answer all the options, right? Let's diagnose this uh, patient. Uh, let's diagnose what is the problem in this patient. First of all, it's a middle-aged man with bloody diarrhea and abdominal pain, right? Then there is right lower quadrant tenderness, which is there. The important thing here is colonoscopic examination shows erythema and ulcers, right? And serologic testing shows P and K positivity. Now, this kind of a history, along with the image, which is showing a lot of inflammation. Can you people appreciate this? Dark blue cells which are present in the background, right? And a very characteristic thing which is seen here is a crypt abscess, right? Crypt abscess. What is actually a crypt abscess? I'll show you subsequently. It's a basically, this is a crypt, right? So when neutrophil or inflammatory cells, they enter a crypt, they enter the lumen of a crypt, it produces a crypt abscess. It's an abscess, right? And these crypt abscesses and inflammation is a characteristic feature or a very important feature to diagnose ulcerative colitis on histopathology. Remember, they can also be seen in cancer I'm not saying they're not seen, but more common in ulcerative colitis, right? So that's why when I see this histopathology, crypt abscesses are seen. And when this line is given that the patient has P and K positivity, both these points mostly points towards a diagnosis of ulcerative colitis more than Crohn's disease, right? So I make a diagnosis that yes, this patient can have ulcerative colitis. Let's see the various options now. Patients can have multiple episodes of exacerbation during the course of illness. Yes, it's a waxing and waning disease, right? That's true. Anal disease is common. No, 
anal disease is not common anal disease is uncommon anal disease is much more common in trans disease right so because this question asked you which is the not true statement right this is the option which is not true right definitive surgery has a role in this disease in case the patient develops steroid related complications yes in ulcerative colitis you can do surgery why because the lesions are continuous as against crohn's disease in which we have skip lesions so we, we do not usually do surgery it's not curative right there is increased risk of colorectal cancer all of you know both inflammatory bowel disease are associated with increased risk of colorectal cancer so which treatment is not true answer is anal disease is common right a few points regarding the histopathology of these inflammatory bowel disease here in crohn's disease so uh, i'll just tell you two or three important points uh, to differentiate crohn's and ulcerative on histopathology one submucosal and crohn's mural which disease is submucosal ulcerative colitis right so when you see inflammatory cells going up to only the submucosa it is usually ulcerative colitis and when i see trans mural involvement all layers have got inflammatory cells it is usually crohn's disease right another important point is the presence of a granuloma as you see in this picture can you see these epithelioid cells spindle shaped cells or slipper shaped nuclei which is seen right so this is basically a granuloma non caseating granuloma is seen in crohn's disease it is absent in ulcerative colitis the important point with ulcerative colitis is these presence of crypt abscesses that's a crypt and we can see these inflammatory cells inside the crypt right you will ask me when what is cryptitis right what is cryptitis itis means inflammation right so neutrophil entering a crypt like this one or this one very difficult to see on this power right that's called as a cryptitis right so these are two important points to differentiate them histopathologically now let us see uh, what do we see on a gross specimen these images can also be asked in your exams here i can see normal mucosa here i can see this lesion here normal mucosa here this is affected right so this is something which is called as skip lesions and these skip lesions are usually seen in crohn's disease right then students another thing which is seen in crohn's disease is this mucosa and this characteristic mucosa is called as cobblestone appearance of mucosa right you can see this is called as a cobblestone appearance of mucosa because it looks like a building with cobblestones right these two images can also be asked now i will just give you a short gist about the differences between crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis because they can also be a key word in a clinical pathologic question right just a few important pointers i'll tell you you already know this table quite clearly smoking is a risk factor for crohn so it can be given in the question ulcerative colitis it is protective right now important here is the gross things we have already done skip lesions cobblestone crohn's then for ulcerative two things which you have to remember are the presence of pseudopolyps and mucosal bridges right uh, another important thing i've already told you transmural and submucosal and in crohn's there is thick rubbery wall whereas ulcerative colitis whereas ulcerative colitis is called as toxic megacolon correct uh, microscopically we have already discussed then uh, you all know that the risk of fissure fistula sinuses is much more common in crohn's disease as compared to ulcerative colitis why because crohn's is transmural ulcerative is submucosal right then these two points can be important keywords in a clinical pathologic question string sign of cantor on radiology is seen in crohn's whereas uh, ulcerative colitis shows a lead pipe or post pipe appearance whereas the antibody which is positive in crohn's is anti saccharomyces cerevisiae not in all the cases though and p anca can be positive in some cases of ulcerative colitis right another thing which is very commonly asked and can be a keyword in a clinical pathologic question is the association of ulcerative colitis with primary sclerosing cholangitis right so that can be a keyword which you have to remember right over to dr rohan please so as uh, dr ila was saying primary sclerosing cholangitis and ankylosing spondylitis these are two extra intestinal manifestations yeah. of uh, inflammatory bowel disease 
which do not get resolved after surgery so this is a very important statement you know there are multiple extra intestinal manifestations of inflammatory bowel disease and they all respond to treatment or, or they respond to surgery but primary sclerosing cholangitis and ankylosing spondylitis does not resolve after surgery so now ma'am has already summarized the differences between the two it is important for us to know the indications for surgery the indications for surgery are pretty much the same in both if there is an emergency like an obstruction perforation or malignancy or if the patient is becoming steroid resistant if the patient is having complications because of steroids or the disease is becoming resistant to steroid therapy those are the indications to carry out surgery and as dr ill has already pointed out that ulcerative colitis is involving a set portion it is involving the entire colon that is pan colitis and some bit of ileum that is backwash ileitis so in ulcerative colitis we can do a definitive surgery and that definitive surgery is known as total proctocolectomy total proctocolectomy plus ipaa ipaa is ileo anal pouch anastomosis right so this is the definitive surgery for ulcerative colitis total proctocolectomy that means entire colon and the rectum and i do an ileo anal pouch anastomosis that is the surgery which is done if you remember this is the same surgery which is also carried out for familial adenomatous polyposis coli syndrome fap syndrome for crohn's disease whenever i'm doing surgery i'm a bit conservative because if i keep on chopping up bowel ultimately i'm going to end up with a short bowel syndrome right so these are the key points regarding inflammatory bowel disease which you should know about the next question is also from a topic which is frequently asked in the exam that is polyps so you have a 32 year old male who's come with episodes of bleeding for rectum since the last 2 to 3 months abdominal examination is normal but on digital rectal examination a lesion is felt 6 cm from the anal verge patient undergoes a colonoscopy and is found to have a pedunculated polyp no other polyps are seen in the rest of the colon and the, the colonoscopist or the gastroenterologist does an endoscopic resection and sends the specimen to the pathologist dr ila finds a small foci of adenocarcinoma at the neck of the polyp what is the level corresponding to the hagets classification this is level 2 hagets classification is important specifically from the central in institute exam point of view this is the classification for a tumor in a polyp right hagets classification so level 0 is if the tumor is if it's a non invasive cancer it's if it's severe dysplasia level 1 if it's only restricted to the head 2 is till the neck of the polyp as in this question 3 is if the cancer is going up to the stalk of the polyp and till level 3 you can do an endoscopic resection right you can do an endoscopic resection as was done in this case level 4 is when it involves the submucosa below the stalk a very important point here is that oil sessile polyps in the question i mentioned a pedunculated polyp but if you have a sessile polyp any cancer in a sessile polyp automatically becomes level 4 so that is another key point which you should know now you know that these adenomatous polyps are associated with colorectal cancer and there is a very important concept of an adenoma carcinoma sequence which has been asked many times in the exam which dr ella would elaborate um so this is the um, multi step carcinogenesis or the adenoma carcinoma sequence which is very frequently asked in the exam even 3 years back students uh, this entire diagram was asked and they had deleted this omitted this and there was a question mark and they had asked what is the answer right so how do we remember uh, this sequence uh, how do we remember the sequence the answer is ak53 we have a very popular book uh, 
which is called as first take for USMLE exams. And in that book, this mnemonic was given. I've taken that this mnemonic from there. That is AK53, right? So A means APC at 5Q21. That is APC gene at 5Q. That's the first hit. Uh, K is for Keras, which is an oncogene at 12P12, right? That's the second hit. And then we have P53, that's the next hit. And that will lead to a carcinoma, right? So a normal colon will become a carcinoma by these three most important hits, right? APC, which is a tumor suppressor gene, Keras, which is an oncogene, and ultimately P53, loss of heterozygosity and telomerase but the most important one is p53 so here in this question we have a 60 year old man who is a suicide victim and the autopsy of that patient comes to you before dying he had been despondent after being informed that he had an extremely aggressive brain tumor right so you already know that this 60 year old person has a brain cancer which is very aggressive there had been a recent onset of headaches, seizures, and mental status changes. And MRI had demonstrated an infiltrating neoplasm invading the cerebral hemispheres and crossing the midline with areas of necrosis and abnormal blood vessels. Very important keywords. The autopsy confirms the MRI findings and also demonstrates hemorrhage and a pseudo palisade arrangement of tumor cells. Now, this is a very interesting question because it combines radiology, pathology, because they have given you pseudo palisading arrangement and surgery because there is a clinical history which is given to you. Right. And they've clearly asked you about the diagnosis. I know that this is a very aggressive tumor with headache seizures. Uh, two things which are very important when we are diagnosing a brain tumor is the location of the tumor. Here, the tumor is invading the cerebral hemisphere, right? So that's a very important keyword, which is uh, there. Then this tumor has a lot of necrosis and hemorrhage. That's another keyword, which is there because extensive necrosis means a higher grade tumor. Uh, correct. Now, the MRI, which is given is almost diagnostic in this case because this is called as a butterfly tumor right we can see a midline tumor infiltrating the cerebral hemisphere looking like a butterfly this is called as a butterfly tumor and this is classically seen in glioblastoma multiforme so even if you don't know uh, what is the histopathology of gbm i can diagnose that the answer in this question is going to be three that is glioblastoma multiforme right like i always say that 80 percent of mcqs you can solve in the exams even without histopathology even if you don't know histopathology how if your clinical concepts and basics are right right so here the answer is glioblastoma multiforme let us quickly see the histopathology of this tumor because these images can also be asked now one thing which we see here is geographical necrosis which is also called as serpentine necrosis serpentine means snake like right why do we call it as a serpentine necrosis because this in the center is the necrotic area what is this this is necrosis and can you people appreciate that these tumor cells these are tumor cells malignant cells which are hyperchromatic they are surrounding this necrotic area, right? So sometimes it looks like a snake. So we call it as a serpentine necrosis. Sometimes it looks like different map like areas. So we call it as a geographical necrosis, right? So this is seen in glioblastoma multiforme. And then another important thing which we see is this blood vessel formation. Now a brain tumor specifically requires a lot of blood, right? A lot of nutrition, right? So there is a blood vessel proliferation which is seen and that blood vessel proliferation which you see here, uh, can you appreciate that this looks like a glomerulus, right? What is a glomerulus? It's a tuft of capillaries, right? So here this structure looks like a glomerulus. That is why this is called as a glomeruloid bodies, right? So remember students, another flashcard in pathology that there are two lesions, two tumors in which we see glomeruloid bodies. One is glioblastoma multiforme and another is yolk sac tumor, right? In yolk sac tumor, we see Schiller dual bodies, which are also called as glomeruloid bodies, right? So that's the histopathology of GBM. Now, with this, I'll give you a small gist of the histopathological features 
of various CNS tumors because this is very important and usually asked in the exam. Any of these images can be uh, given, right? So for pilocytic astrocytoma, two keywords which you have to remember, rosenthal fibers and microsis. GBM we have already done. Oligodendroglioma, leave the other things, just two important things. Fried egg appearance, right? So we have these cells, central nuclei, and clear space around them. They look like fried eggs, so fried egg appearance. And chicken wire blood vessels, right? There are anastomosing vascular channels. So these are called as chicken wire blood vessels. Ependymoma, remember one term, perivascular pseudorosettes. What is a rosette? Rose-like tumor cells forming like a flower, a rosette, right? Because these tumor cells, they are surrounding a blood vessel. That is why this is called as a perivascular pseudorosette. Meduloblastoma, another very important topic frequently asked. It's a small round blue cell tumor usually seen in children, remember, and usually located in the posterior fossa or cerebellum. Three keywords, small round blue cell, posterior fossa or cerebellum, and children, right? So in addition, you also see Homer right rosettes, right? Meningioma, I've already told you, Samoma body is a keyword, and Schwannoma, now students, is one of the most popular questions. This has been asked in AIMS exam almost five times, right? NF2 gene mutation on chromosome number 22 can lead to Schwannoma, right? What is the histopathology? Antony A, Antony B. What is Antony A? That's a hypercellular area. What is Antony B? That's a hypocellular area. And what are Veroke bodies? They are seen in between these Antony A and Antony B areas, right? That's a small gist of the various CNS tumors, which you need to remember. Over to Dr. Rohan for the management. So glioblastoma multiforme is the most aggressive brain tumor. And unfortunately, it does not have a very good survival. As we speak, uh, we recently lost a very dear senior of ours to this disease. And I mean, I can attribute a lot of my medicine learning to him. So it's very sad to see people suffering from this disease. And despite aggressive surgery, radiotherapy and oral, oral chemo in the form of temozolamide, still the median survival is just 15 to 18 months in these patients after diagnosis. So the treatment is surgery, radiotherapy and oral temozolamide. Moving on to the next question, and this again highlights one thing which Dr. Ella mentioned, that a lot of times these long stem questions will have a lot of clues for you. And even if you don't know the image which is given, you can still make a diagnosis. So if you have keen clinical concept, you can make the diagnosis easily. If you look at it the other way around, if you know the image well, then without looking at the entire question, you can make the diagnosis. You can just read the last line and then you can start answering. But Dr. Rohan, the problem is that in second year, students hardly read the images. That's uh, unfortunate. That's fine. And but that if... is the point which we want to uh, uh, tell you that please um, make your basic concepts right. Right. And do revise your images exactly. because for your exam, these images can really be time saving. If you know the image, you can quickly make the diagnosis. So you have a 42 year old businessman who is uh, a type A personality suffering from severe heartburn. He consumes six to seven coffees a day. He's taken multiple over the counter medicines for this problem, but they don't offer much relief. Somebody suggests him to meet a cardiologist, but the ECG is normal. Finally, he gets an endoscopy done and the biopsy reveals this finding. Now, even as a surgeon, I can make out that these cells here, these are your typical goblet cells. And you know these goblet cells are characteristic feature of a condition known as Barrett's esophagus. Now, Barrett's esophagus is metaplasia of squamous epithelium to columnar epithelium, also known as specialized intestinal metaplasia, right? You will see these red velvety mucosa and you take biopsy from this red velvety mucosa and the presence of goblet cells will be diagnostic. With this information, let's look at the options. And they're asking which statement is not true. 
regular two yearly follow up endoscopies are done in this patient this is true in accordance with the seattle protocol which i'll just uh, mention sometime in high grade dysplasia esophagectomy should be done this is not true in high grade dysplasia three monthly follow up should be done this condition can be asymptomatic as well this is true and mason trichome is a special stain used in the diagnosis of this patient this is also not true so this was an ini ct type of a question where you will be given if a or b is correct or a or c is correct or b and d is not correct you'll get those kind of options so these two options are not correct mason trichome is not the stain used dr ela will tell you what is the characteristic stain used in this condition in barrett's esophagus whenever somebody is diagnosed with this we follow the seattle protocol where we do a two yearly follow up and we do regular biopsies if it comes out to be a low grade dysplasia you ablate that mucosa and you reduce the endoscopic interval to 6 months if it is a high grade dysplasia you ablate the mucosa reduce the interval to 3 months and if cancer is seen then you carry out an esophagectomy in these patients the special stain dr ela will just elaborate on that uh so the image of parrot's esophagus has been very frequently asked and this same image was asked in the exams a few years back right so uh, as dr rohan correctly mentioned that these are the goblet cells which you see but you all know that uh, the entire esophagus is lined by stratified squamous epithelium right so can you people appreciate that this on the right hand side is the stratified squamous epithelium right and now the entire esophagus should be lined by this but here when i get a esophageal biopsy and when the patient complains of gastroesophageal reflux disease and it's a young patient uh and when i see start seeing these glands right can you appreciate these glandular structures which are there so i start thinking clearly in terms of barrett's esophagus or metaplasia right uh, the characteristic histopathological features are two intestinal metaplasia and the presence of goblet cells now a latest question and the latest image which is usually asked is what is the special stain now the special stain which we use is called as alchin blue why do we use alchin blue because um goblet cells are, are a characteristic feature of barrett's they will not be seen in a normal esophagus because normal esophagus has stratified squamous epithelium and these goblet cells contain mucin alchin blue is basically a stain which we use for mucin right this can be a image in the future exams you can see these cells which are there which have some bluish material inside these are all goblet cells and this epithelium which i see here is clearly stratified squamous epithelium correct so that's a image which can be asked in the future exams right let's move on to the next question the next question says that a 72 year old copd patient who was a chronic smoker also present to the opt with complaints of persistent cough since the last 3 months right he also had two to three episodes of hemoptysis in the two weeks surgeon notices moon like faces when the patient comes to the opt orders a hrct and the ct reveals a 2.5 cm tumor in the left lung with involvement of the main bronchus patient also has enlarged ipsilateral hilar lymph nodes on ct scan metastatic workup reveals no distant metastasis the biopsy sent to a pathologist is shown below what which of the following is associated with this lesion right again students a long stem question with multiple options and a image first you have to make the diagnosis correctly right let us see the keyword elderly chronic smoker with cough hemoptysis and a tumor right now in this tumor a very important keyword which i look for is moon like faces right when there is a lung tumor and moon like faces is given to you think about a small cell cancer why because small cell cancer produces paraneoplastic syndrome that is a cushing syndrome right and uh, moon like faces is a symptom of cushing syndrome correct then uh, this tumor is affecting the main bronchus and the next important clue here is the image which is given 
In this image, can you people appreciate these very small cells which are dark blue? And one thing which you can see is one cell can fit into the shape of another cell. This thing is called as nuclear molding, right? That one nuclei is molding into the shape of another nuclei, as you can see in a lot of cells here. So nuclear molding is another thing which is seen in small cell lung cancer. So with this history, I come to a diagnosis that this patient has small cell lung cancer. Now let's look at the options. It is more common in women and usually peripheral. No, all of us know it's more common in men and it is centrally located because it is aggressive can go to the periphery. So this is incorrect. Generally, I'm unable to surgical cure at the time of diagnosis. This small cell lung cancer has the worst prognosis. Surgery is usually not done. It is chemo and radiosensitive. So that is why this statement is also incorrect. Shows nuclear molding and azopardi effect on histopathology. This question, this option is absolutely correct. It is associated with this. That's why this is the answer, right? What is azopardi effect, right? So, uh, uh, azopardi effect is basically basophilic staining of the walls. Can you people appreciate in this image that this? blood vessel wall is very dark blue unlike normal blood vessels right basophilic stain this is because of the release of nuclear chromatin by the tumor cells right chromatin nucleus blue basophilic right so these blood vessels they become densely basophilic and that thing is called as azopardi effect this is a characteristic feature of uh, small cell lung cancer so this is the option which is correct Last option is the TNM staging for this tumor is T1, N1, M0. Dr. Rohan will soon elaborate on the TNM staging, which has been frequently asked in the MCQ exam. Before that, students, I'll just give you a small gist of the various lung cancer because this is a very hot topic with the examiner, right? Uh, all the lung cancers are much more common in men, except for adenocarcinoma, which is more common in women, right? Centrally located, usually squamous cell, small cell. Peripherally located adeno, remember, non-smoker adeno, right? All the others are smoking associated, right? Which has the strongest association with cigarette smoking answer is small cell lung cancer, right? So three important clinical pathologic parameters or keywords uh, in a question uh, for adenocarcinoma lung are one, non-smoker, another, women, another, peripherally located, right? Then paraneoplastic syndrome is another clue for small cell con lung cancer, which is most commonly associated with paraneoplastic syndrome. We have Cushing syndrome and SIADH. And for squamous cell cancer, remember it is hypercalcemia. Why is there hypercalcemia? Because of release of parathyroid hormone deleted peptide, PDHRP, right? Also important for exam is the mutations for SCC P53. Adenocarcinoma can be associated with ALK, KERAS, or EGFR, and small cell is associated with LMIC, right? Microscopically, very, very important. All these images can come in the exam. SCC, anywhere in the body, I have told you a number of times, keratin pearls and desmosomes. Adenocarcinoma, adeno means gland. So it shows glands lined by pleomorphic cells. Small cell carcinoma, we've already discussed, and large cell cancer will show large pleomorphic cells. Then this is another potential question which is asked and can be a keyword, the markers. Any epithelial tumor like SCC, cytokeratin is a marker. Two new markers which we use for SCC are P63 and P40, right? Adenocarcinoma, very important markers are TTF1, that is thyroid transcription factor 1, and NAPSIN A. Latest marker students, potential question. Small cell lung cancer, I uh, very commonly see, and this image has also been asked, it is a neuroendocrine tumor, right? Any neuroendocrine tumor in the body will be three markers positive. The markers are neuron-specific enolase, chromogranin, or synaptopycin, right? Please remember this table, very important. Dr. Rohan, please elaborate on the staging. So lung cancer is becoming a very important topic. Uh, in last two years, uh, there have been questions in the NEET exam pertaining to surgery as well. They've asked the staging of lung cancer, which is why I want to highlight that. 
and also there were some scores related to lung cancer. Now the changes in the eighth AJCC classification of lung cancer, T1 is less than equal to three centimeters, not involving the bronchus. T2 is more than three centimeters, less than equal to five centimeters or involvement of main bronchus without carina. T3 is more than 5 but less than equal to 7 centimeters. T4 is more than 7 centimeters or invasion of diaphragm, mediastinum, great vessels or the adjacent structures. N1 is the presence of peribronchular hilar lymph nodes. N2 is mediastinal lymph nodes and N3 is contralateral mediastinal or hilar lymph nodes. The changes which have occurred are that earlier in the 7th AJCC classification, up till 2 to 3 centimeters was T1B, which has now become T1C, right? The other change has been T2A. T3 was more than 7 centimeters, which here has become more T4, right? So this is another thing which you should know for the exam. And in this question, we had a patient where the tumor was 2.5 centimeters and it was involving the main bronchus. So the diagnosis, so the staging here will be T2, N1, M0. So you need to know the staging of lung cancer. It is one of the cancers where staging is important. Others being, of course, uh, breast, oral cancer. These are two cancers from which staging, which is frequently asked. Colorectal cancer also has been asked in the UPSC exam of late. So these uh, stagings have also been asked in the exam of late. The score which was asked was the Thoraco score. That was the score which was asked, which is pertaining to the mortality after thoracic surgery. That was the score which was asked uh, from this topic in the NEET exam. So through these questions, I hope you people have learned why integration is important. And if you integrate, you will be able to retain things for a longer period, right? Things grow stronger when you integrate and you're able to retain them for a longer period of time as well. So whenever now you're reading surgery or you're re reading pathology, always read it with a clinical touch and try to correlate both the subjects so that it helps you for your future exams. Also, if you study medicine in an integrated way, you will become very, very good physicians because uh, um, the goal is not only to clear the MCQ exam, it is also to become very good doctors, right? And treat patients, right? Uh, so with this, we hope you like the session and we will keep on doing such sessions in future as well. Uh, thank you so much and all the best. Thank you very much. If you have any questions pertaining to this session, you can ask us on the Marrowlings Facebook group or our Instagram IDs yeah. are mentioned here. You can send us a message there and we'll be happy to answer them. Thank, Thank you very you. much.